Hi, today's reading is from the first letter of John, chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also might have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. So John was an eyewitness. He had seen Jesus, seen his face, seen his dark hair, his brown skin tanned by the sun. He'd seen his smile, he'd seen the love in his eyes. And John had heard Jesus' voice, the voice that spoke tenderly to women and outcasts, the voice that told playful stories about farming and sheep and servants and banquets and treasure. He'd heard him playing and laughing with children, rebuking the Pharisees, calling the dead forth from the grave. And John had touched Jesus. He'd reclined next to him at the Passover meal, resting his teenage head on Jesus' breast. He'd had his dusty, smelly feet washed by Jesus' rough carpenter's hands. John was one of Jesus' most close disciples. He'd been with Jesus at some of his most intimate moments. He'd seen him wrestling in anguish in the Garden of Gethsemane. He'd seen him dying in agony on the cross. He'd seen him suddenly, mysteriously alive again afterwards. The same, but different. John was an eyewitness. And this was John's story. Jesus really did live and walk the earth in first century Palestine. Historians and academics do not disagree about that. There is plenty of evidence for Jesus, plenty of evidence that he existed. He's not some made up mythical figure. Jesus is as real as Julius Caesar or Alexander the Great or Cleopatra. That's not a matter for debate. What is a matter for debate and for decision is who he was, who he really was, and what his life means. And John in his letter wants to say, first of all, what I am telling you, this good news, is my story, it's John's story. John is saying you can trust me. I'm telling you what I've seen with my eyes, what I've heard, what my hands have touched. And I'm telling you, says John, that this man I knew, this man who appeared and lived among us, is the word of life. That means he is God's great message to the world in flesh, in human skin and bones, real, historical, visible, tangible. John is saying, I was there. I've seen it. And this person, this Jesus, is the very life of God. He says in verse two, I am proclaiming to you the eternal life. I am proclaiming to you the eternal life. And when he says that, he's not just saying, well, I'm telling you that Jesus is the way for you to get to heaven when you die. He's saying much more than that. He's saying that this person who lived and breathed and sang and laughed and broke bread and drank wine gives us a glimpse and a foretaste both back to creation and forward into eternity. He says Jesus was with the Father and it's kind of got echoes of that preface for John's gospel. He was with God in the beginning. We read that every Christmas, don't we? And Jesus' existence, his life, his teaching, his love, his healing power, his grace, his death and resurrection, all of those things show us what God's everlasting kingdom is like and will be like. In the person of Jesus, says John, eternity collides with right now. In the person of Jesus, says John, heaven and earth meet and touch. In the person of Jesus, God and humanity 
are one and our humdrum lives of sight and sound and touch and smell and taste are given significance and meaning and purpose and grace, grace for the past and also hope for the future. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. That's verse three. So John, the eyewitness, wants the people reading his letter, which now includes us, to know that he is telling the truth about Jesus. John knew him. John is like a witness in court giving his testimony. He wants us to believe him. What do you think about Jesus? Each of us has to make up our minds sometime. Jesus was real. He walked the earth. I would say that if I wanted to know what someone was really like and who they really were, I would ask one of their closest friends. I would ask someone who really knew them, someone who saw them and heard them and spent time with them. I would ask John. So John's story speaks to us, challenging us to make our decision about Jesus. Who do you think he really was? Just a man? Just a man? But John's story also speaks to those of us who call ourselves Christians because we too are called to give eyewitness testimony. We too are called to tell our story. Each one of us has a story to tell. And many of us have what we might call a testimony, like a story of how we met Jesus, how we came to believe in him, how we perhaps came to be baptised. But our story does not and should not stop when we become a Christian. If it does stop there, there's something wrong. We're going nowhere. We've kind of reached a full stop. We've reached a stalemate. No, our story should go on. Our story should continue as we get to know Jesus better and better, as the Holy Spirit works in our lives, as he leads and guides us, as we pray, as we seek to serve God, as we see God at work every day all around us, as we read the scriptures and as we come to understand more and more how our small stories are part of this great story of God's purposes that the Bible is telling. I'd like each person listening to this, if you can, to spend some time maybe over this next week thinking, well, what is my story? What good news do I have to tell today? What is Jesus saying and doing that I have seen, that I have heard, that I have touched, that I have tasted? What good news story do I have to share with my friends and family perhaps who don't yet know him or even with other Christians to encourage one another to build one another up might be small things might be big things might be miracles or might be those little moments of grace maybe it's bible verses that have leapt out and smacked us in the face in the way that they've spoken into our lives I know that happens to me sometimes it might be ways that we see perhaps other people in our church growing in their knowledge and love of God, in their grace, in their generosity of heart, in their depth of love for one another and for their community. Could also be stories of struggle, stories of difficulty, maybe stories that you're in the middle of right now and you can't quite see the ending. Maybe the ending is hidden at the moment. And you're in the middle trying to figure it all out. But it's still your story, stories of pain, stories of grief, stories of worry and fear. But stories of how God is at work in the midst of all of that. But I can tell you this. Many ordinary people who don't know God might not want to hear the four spiritual laws. They might not want to hear a philosophical argument for the existence of God. Some will, but many won't. But if you and I are able to tell our stories, people who have heard and seen with our eyes 
and touched with our hands, if we're able to say this is how the eternal life of God is at work in my life right now, and maybe in your life too, maybe in their lives too, in the lives of the people we're speaking to who haven't yet recognised how Jesus is there at work already in their lives, well then they might listen. Then they might realise that there is something in this, that there is something about this man Jesus. Just want to finish by having a look at the last couple of verses in this passage, because they tell us what the point of all this is. We're often told as Christians that we have a duty to witness to other people or to do evangelism or to do mission or to tell people about Jesus. But I think often we don't really think very hard about the real reasons why we do this. And here in this beautiful preface to his letter, John gives us some very, very, very good reasons. And they might be different from the reasons we've been led to expect. Here's verses three and four of the passage again. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. John is telling his story. He's telling his good news so that you also may have fellowship with us. That's what he says. As Christians, we kind of bandy this word fellowship around quite a lot, but often we don't really think about what it means. It crops up a lot in the New Testament. The Greek word that is used is koinonia. I hope I've said that right, koinonia. And to me, fellowship means something deeper than friendship. It's a unity that kind of transcends all barriers. It transcends barriers of age and ethnicity and language and gender and background. And we can have deep, deep bonds of fellowship with someone because of our shared love of Jesus, because of that unity that comes when the spirit is at work among us. And I have just found over and over again that whenever there is deep, deep Christian understanding, love, mutual support and encouragement, there is nothing more beautiful and nothing that speaks to others and outsiders more of God's kingdom and more eloquently. It's that joy and delight that comes from being with people that you really love, knowing that Jesus is present, that his spirit is at work in the midst of us. That's what fellowship is and means. And that's why we have church. You can't do fellowship by yourself. You can't do fellowship watching a live stream of some church, well, maybe a bit. But that's why COVID has been so difficult for so many of us. Church is about that fellowship, that fellowship with one another. Church should not look like infighting, gossiping, backbiting, power games, or lots of people sitting apart from one another who don't really know anything about one another's lives. Sadly, that is what often it does look like in many settings. Church should look like koinonia, joy and love and delight in one another as we see the image of God reflected in one another's faces. It can happen on a Sunday and it should happen on a Sunday, but in my experience, it actually happens more often in small groups or twos and threes in between times or even over the phone as we meet, as we eat, as we pray, as we talk, as we do mission together. So why does John tell the readers his good news story, his eyewitness account? And why do we do evangelism? Why do we bother to witness? It's to make more fellowship. It's to make more of this koinonia, more of this beautiful fellowship, more of this being with one another in the presence of God. We want our friends and families to enjoy this fellowship with us. And of course, it's not just fellowship with one another we're talking about. It's fellowship with God. Fellowship with the Father and the Son, as it says in verse 3. And as we pray every week in the grace, we say the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, don't we? 
God ultimately wants us to be with him. That's what all of creation is heading towards. That is what the cross was for. That's what the creation was for. And that's what we're hoping for at the end of time. Being with God. God being with us. Us being with God. Being with on a deep level. Revelation 21 verse 3, right at the end of the Bible. Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. Fellowship, being with one another, being with God. And the result of all this is what? What does it say in 1 John 1 verse 4? Joy. The result of all this is joy, that our joy may be complete. There's something so wonderful, isn't there? about spending time with a close friend or maybe a husband or wife, maybe your child or your parent. Just having that moment of love and connection and peace and joy in one another's presence. That's what God wants for us with him and with one another for eternity. This is what we hope for. This is what we pray for. This is what we pray for, for those we meet, for those members of our family, our communities, our colleagues at work. We long for them to be with us, to have fellowship with us, to have fellowship with God and to know that koinonia, that shared love, that joy. Telling our stories results in fellowship with one another and fellowship with God and ultimately in joy. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story, says Psalm 107. It's a story of goodness, a story of beauty, a story of truth. And most of all, a story which draws people into the presence of the living God. Let's pray. Lord, often we don't want to talk about Jesus to people. We find it difficult. We find it scary. We find it intimidating. We worry that it's going to make us and them feel uncomfortable. But Lord God, I pray that you will give us that deep love for one another and that deep desire to see people come into that fellowship with one another and with you so that we, we long to tell our story that we long to share the amazing things that you have done for us and that you are doing in and among us. Lord God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he walked this earth, that he is alive today and living in and with us. Lord God, we pray that we might tell that story of our relationship with him to those who have not yet heard, and that they too might be drawn into that joy, that fellowship of joy that comes as we love and serve you through the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.